Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I believe Elizabeth had thanked you guys for helping yesterday, but I will uh, reiterate that. Thank you for helping the last couple of days, packing all the eggs, probably about 2,000 eggs on uh, Friday night. We actually got that done fairly quick. Uh, we, that was probably one of the best turnouts we've had packing eggs. And then uh, we had plenty of volunteers on, Sunday, on Saturday. And uh, who knows how many people exactly came out. What matters, though, is that we uh, loved on our community and provided something for them. Uh, you know, so many people just view this weekend as a normal weekend, and they forget the reason for this weekend. Uh, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus, and we gently reminded them of that yesterday and invited them to church and you know who knows how many seeds were planted yesterday so just thank you for for everything that y'all have done thank you for being a church that we can uh, rely on uh, i was thinking this morning that it's somewhat easy to pastor you guys uh, because of how willing you are to love god and love others so thank you for that uh, we are going to continue in our series on the sermon on the mount today and this was going to be the the biggest challenge when i knew i was doing this series around easter was to figure out how to relate the Sermon on the Mount to an Easter message. Because I think we genuinely think the pastor is supposed to preach on the resurrection specifically on Easter Sunday. And that's what I'm going to be preaching on today. I did figure out a way to connect the pieces together. Um, but today what I want to talk to you about is having a resurrection mindset. To get started, let's talk about how we're right in the middle of March Madness. Right in the middle of it, we got uh, Duke and State playing today, which is going to be a, a good game. Uh, I think Felicia told me yesterday, she said, really, for us Duke fans, it's a win-win, because you'd love to see State do good. You know, you'd love to see State, because they haven't won hardly anything. And, and, and uh, you would love to see the Duke win. So for us uh, Duke fans, look at Randy today, wearing two Duke things to one State thing. So I told him, I said, that means you're pulling for Duke, right? And he said, no, he's, he's sentimental, sentimental for NC State. I played a little basketball in high school, and uh, if you know anything about basketball, basketball is a game of runs. One team will go on a run, go up 10, 15 points. I think UConn yesterday went on a 30 nothing run to beat the team that they were playing. They were tied at 23, and then the next time you look at the score, it's 53 to 23. They went on a huge run. So basketball is a game of run. Your, your team can be down by 15 points and yet come back and win by 5 or 10 points, just depending on how big the run is. Uh, I figured I'd pull this out since, you know, uh, I'm a Duke fan. This is going back a few years ago. Uh, Duke was down at halftime. Chalker, I know. Uh, and when your team is down at halftime or when they're down by 15 points or whatever it may be, that feeling's tough, isn't it? At this point in that game, I was, yeah, there was a hole to dig out of, and it felt like there was a hole in my heart because I knew that the next day I would have to deal with all the Carolina fans at church because for some reason they always do it on Saturday night so that us Duke pastors have to deal with y'all on Sunday morning. It's a rough feeling, though. You, the worry, the anxiety, the tension that you have when your team is down gets your heart rate up. You keep checking the score, and for me, I always keep looking at the bottom part of the TV to see, have we closed the gap? We were down by 10 three minutes ago. We're down by 7 now. If we keep that up, we will, we will have won the game by the end. You don't know how the game's going to end, so you're on the edge of your seat just waiting to see what's going to happen. And, of course, I would not be mentioning this if Duke didn't win, uh, which we're used to, of course. Have you ever watched a game, though, that was previously recorded? Or, you, or maybe it's, you're watching ESPN Classics, and you know how the game is going to turn out. You know what the outcome is. When you know what the outcome is, it takes the experience out of watching. You have no reason to feel worried or anxious or to feel that tension because you already know what the outcome is going to be. Kind of like the UNC Alabama game the other day. We knew what the outcome was going to be. Alabama was going to beat UNC. I think I guessed that in at least one of my three or four brackets. I don't know how many brackets I made. 
I, I'll give you a tip. Don't ever have UNC in the Final Four in the championship game. That's how my brackets. I'm number one in our bracket team right now because I didn't pick UNC to go very far. Um, but when you know what the game is going to look like, you don't have the experience of watching. You don't have the, the tension that you have. You don't need to be sitting on the edge of your seat because you know they're going to come back and win. What does this have to do with having a resurrection mindset? Because how often do we go through this game we call life anxious, worried, and tense because we don't know what's going to happen? Many people in this church, in this room, have been through the ringer this past year. Many of you have experienced major health problems, have experienced the loss of loved ones, have experienced family issues. And it's easy, me and Sarah was talking about this the other day, it's easy after something bad happens to get into that tense, anxious field mindset where you just know something bad's going to happen next. And then you live your life on the edge, waiting to see what's going to happen. But here's the thing. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to feel that way. Because we know how this game we call life is going to end. Because Scripture tells us, and this will be a verse we read later, Scripture tells us that somehow, some way, no matter what we are going through, God will turn it around for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's the resurrection mindset that we are called to have. And that's what I think Jesus is leading into here in the next part of this Sermon on the Mount. He gives a teaching, as he often does in the Sermon on the Mount, that seems disconnected. Yet, you can discover connections between them, and that's what we're going to do today. So let's talk about uh, some facts that will help us in developing a resurrection mindset. And then we'll define resurre resurrection mindset at the end clearly. We're in Matthew chapter 6 today, and we're going to continue pick up where we left off last week in verses 22 through 23. Jesus says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So Jesus compares the eye to a lamp. Now what does a lamp do? It provides light. Or you can turn the light off and the lamp doesn't provide light. He says the eye is the same way. And when he says that it is clear in this translation, other translations will say other things. Um, the literal word that would have been used here is single. When you have a single eye, your whole body will be full of light. Basically what he's hitting there is that when you have a good eye. I have one eye that is better than the other eye. Every time I go to the doctor, one of them's worse than the other one. Um, when you have a good eye, is what Jesus is saying here, your body will be full of light. Now, obviously, he's not talking about a literal eye. What he is talking about is what are you focusing on? What are you looking at? It is the lamp of the body. What you are seeing is going to provide the light or the darkness into your life. This saying, this would have been a saying back then that they would have understood. Uh, this saying about having your eye clear or having your eye single. This was a saying that communicated that someone was generous. Which kind of goes along with what he just said about not valuing material things. Choosing to invest in eternal things, building up those rewards in heaven. He contrasts the good eye, though, which would be the generous eye, which would be the eye that's focusing on good things, with a bad eye. He says, if your eye is bad, your life will be full of darkness. So if the very thing that's supposed to be providing the light to the body is providing darkness instead, he says that darkness is going to be vast. That darkness is going to be great. So my first point for you is this. Everyone is being formed by whatever they focus on. That's what Jesus is getting to here is by what you focus on. If you focus on bad things, you're going to have darkness in your life. If you focus on good things, you're going to have light 
in your life. Uh, listening to a book this past week, and this was a point that they made somewhat, not necessarily exactly like this, but was talking about how everyone is being formed every day. We are all uh, meant to have some Play-Doh up here. We're all like Play-Doh, being formed, being uh, morphed into whatever we want it to be. Now, Play-Doh doesn't harden if you take care of it. If you keep it in the container and keep it sealed and so on and so forth. And we're the same way. You're always being formed. Play-Doh is formed by whatever touches it. So if we put it in the container, it's going to look somewhat like the container when it comes out. If we have it in our hands and we're balling it up into a ball, it's going to look like a ball. If we flatten it out, we flatten it out. We're the same way. Whatever is touching our life or whatever we are touching by focusing on it is forming us in some way or another. Whether that be a person, whether that be something we're watching, whether that be something that we see, those things, whatever we focus on, is forming us in one way or another. Whatever you focus on has the most power over your life. So if you focus on bad things, they're going to bring darkness. If you focus on good things, they'll bring light. And boy, don't you know today we are surrounded by darkness. It's easy to focus on bad things. I know many, I, I've heard this so many times over the last probably five, six, ten years. People have turned off the news. People have stopped listening to the podcast. People have stopped listening. I mean, Randy's one of them that's told me this. He said, man, I, he realized that when he's listening to all this bad stuff, it brings darkness into his life. It makes him mad. And I've learned the same thing. We used to have Fox News on every night. And we learned very, well, not very quickly, but we learned, honestly, probably after the last election, that that's not what we need to be watching at night because it just gets you riled up to go to sleep. And I have been so much healthier after turning off that junk. My mind, my mental health has been healthier. My spiritual life has been healthier after turning off all that darkness that can enter into our life. I mean, you turn on the news now, it's all about war. It's all about murders. It's all about tragedy. It's about the bridge collapse up in Baltimore. You know, it's bad things. When you're constantly focusing on that stuff, that darkness is going to enter into your life. So don't be surprised if you end up depressed or down because it's, you're just inviting the bad stuff in your life. Same thing with pictures and videos on social media. Um, different things on social media can spark different reactions in us. Uh, it can spark lust, as we talked about a few weeks ago. It can spark jealousy. It can spark shame. Uh, it can spark these feelings that then you have to deal with, but it's because that's what you're focusing on. Same thing with movies and TV shows. Be careful what you're watching. Be careful what you're allowing your kids to watch. Um, we're, we're careful. We, we always use parents' guide to find out what we are watching. Because when you're constantly watching these dark or evil TV shows and movies, you're inviting darkness into your life. You're focusing on it. Same thing with personal problems. It doesn't have to be a material thing. When you focus on your personal problems or your family problems or your circumstances that you are in, of course you're going to get down. Of course you're going to invite that darkness into your life. And like I said, it's super easy because we're constantly surrounded by it. We're constantly, because we're constantly surrounded by it, just as I look at the bottom of the score on the game to see if we're catching up, that's kind of how we're looking at life. Am I catching up yet? Am I getting there yet? When you focus on it, the darkness enters into our life and it will present a depression. And maybe not just depression, but just a general lack of well-being. Which is why, as followers of Jesus, part of having that resurrection mindset means that we choose to focus on good things. We choose to focus on things that bring light into our life. And who is the light? John 8, 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. You remember how I said that that verse that we talked about, that saying could be translated as single eye? This is 
basically Jesus trying to think about being single-minded. Not focusing on the things of this world, but focusing on Jesus, who is the light of life. And when you focus on Jesus, when you focus on good things, when you focus on the one good person that ever walked this earth, when you focus on the one who was raised from the dead, you will invite light into your life. Not only that, but remember how that saying talks about being generous? It, it was a way of talking about being generous back then. When you focus on Jesus, it's going to lead you to being generous. Because when you focus on Jesus, you're going to be Christ-like in your life. You're inviting Jesus to work in your life, to change you. Which is, then leads into something that Jesus already mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. We're told in John that Jesus is the light of the world, but then in Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, You, followers of him, us, the church, we are the light of the world. How do we become the light of the world? By focusing on the light of the world. What happens when the very people that are supposed to be the light of the world are instead focusing on darkness and therefore filled with darkness? then we no longer are the light of the world. Which could be why we see our world getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Because we are allowing the darkness to cave in on us. We're focusing on the wrong things. We have to be filled with light that will cast out the darkness. We have to follow Jesus and focus on Jesus. You know, when thinking about Holy Week, I don't know if enough focus is given to Saturday. Friday is when Jesus was killed on the cross. Saturday, well, I think they call it Silent Saturday. That would have been the hardest day for the disciples. For all of those who called themselves followers of Jesus. It was probably the darkest day of their lives. Because on that day, it looked like Jesus had lost. It looked like there was no hope for what was going to happen in the future. It looks like that God has given up on humanity. You know, I think the disciples may have even been questioning if Jesus really was the Son of God at that point. They doubted who he was. Not only that, but the disciples were wanted because they were with Jesus. And therefore they could be facing death as well. It would have been easy for them to have focus on the darkness of their circumstances, and that does seem to be what they were doing. On Friday, most of the disciples abandoned Jesus. Not many disciples are present at the cross. On Saturday, it would have been their Sabbath, so they rested, but they rested behind closed doors. And then the day that Jesus was resurrected, we're told in John twenty nineteen that they were behind closed doors. So it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were together due to fear the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. What does that scripture tell us right there? They are hiding. They're behind locked doors because they are afraid. They're anxious. They're worried. They're scared. They're focusing on the wrong things. And because of that, they were filled with darkness. And it took the light of life to bring peace to their ancient souls. They didn't have what we are calling today a resurrection mindset. Because if they did, they would have focused on what the light had already told them. What Jesus had already told them. And we'll read that a little bit later. Continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus then changes subjects to some degree a little bit. He says, no one can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus, in this passage, may be expounding a little bit more on having that clear eye or good eye or single eye. He basically was saying, you've got to have one person, one master in your life. 
you can't serve two different people. You're going to love one, hate the other, or you're going to be devoted to one, you're going to despise the other. And then he specifically gives the example of God and wealth. Now, there's another verse that says, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. I think that's what Jesus is, is kind of getting to here. Either you're going to serve wealth and money and the love of money, or you're going to serve God. Here's a truth for us today that will help us in developing our resurrection mindset. We serve whatever we focus on. We have the choice of what is our master in our life. We don't have a choice whether we will have a master. You're going to have a master. Everyone is following something or someone. It goes back to the first point. Something is always forming us. And what Jesus is getting to here is you can't have two masters. You can't have two different things vying for your attention. Because if you do, you're going to hate one and love one. You're going to be devoted to one. You're going to despise the other. You can't have a divided heart. You can't focus on two different things at the same time. James says in James 1.8 that this person is double-minded. And therefore, they are unstable in all they do. I don't mean this as a joke, but we have unstable people today. In the world and in the church. And I think it's because we are serving different masters. So we have a choice to make each and every day. Who do we serve? Do we serve the things of this world? Listen to another book, and it talks about big tech. So that's Facebook and and Twitter or X, whatever it is now, TikTok, all these social media companies, Google, um, I don't even know what all, Apple, uh, Android, I've got to throw them in there. Uh, Big tech, you know, studies you. They have a file on you somewhere. They know what you like. They know what they can put up on your Facebook feed to get your attention. They know exactly what to do to be your master. And they literally make millions and billions off of us being our master. Randy just said algorithm, and that's right. They have an algorithm that makes sure to put the right things in front of you so that you don't focus on God, so that you focus on what they want you to focus on. Same thing with money. Love of money is root of all evil. Some of us, allow our jobs to be our master that's what drives our life that's where a majority of our focus is and when i say our jobs become our master i don't know many people that just love their job but they go to work to make money and so their money becomes your master or how about this pleasure we live in a pleasure seeking world Always searching for, if we go back to the pornography sermon, the sermon on lust, always trying to get that brain reaction in our, in our mind to have that pleasure. Not necessarily from sexual things, but from social media, from buying something, from all these other things. Or maybe you allow your circumstances to be your master. You allow the problems that you face in life to get you down we all have a master but we have to choose to make god our master because he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords he is the one who died for us but here's a here's a convicting question for us today if your life was played out in a movie who would we say your master is? And when I ask that, I'm asking, where is your focus? Who would we say or what would we say you focused on? Was it God? It's going back to the Heaven series I did a while back, many people who had near-death experiences said that... Um, Jesus sits with them and their life plays out like a movie. So you'll be looking one day, very possibly, at your life played out in a movie. 
are you going to be convicted in that moment that you didn't focus on Jesus like you should? A lot of the people who had the near-death experiences um, felt ashamed because they said, here's this being next to me that loves me like no one has ever loved me, and I couldn't hardly focus on him at all in my life. If they looked at your bank account, who do they say you serve? You can tell a lot about a person by looking at their bank account. Who do you serve in your life? It's important that you serve God because whoever you serve is responsible for providing for you. This goes back to the slave and master context of that time. The master would have been responsible for providing for that slave their, their necessary needs. We are not self-sustaining creatures, whether we want to believe we are or not. Think about your life. You are always looking outside of yourself to seek help from someone or something. We were not made to live alone. You are always looking to something else to provide what you need whether that is uh love i mean we all have this inbuilt desire to be loved to feel loved you can't you can't feel loved yourself necessarily you need someone else to love you we are always looking for our material needs to be met from outside of ourselves. i mean we can't grow food ourselves we got to have plants to be able to do that um we are always looking outside of ourselves for things to provide for us. And so a master during that time would have been expected to provide for those under their care. So if you focus on the things of the world, are the things of the world going to be able to provide what you need? No. Everything in this world provides a temporary fix. Everything in this world provides that fix that uh, makes you forget the hole that you have in your heart that only God can fill. And ultimately, it leads you to only wanting more. See, the truth is, is God is the only one that can provide us with what we truly need. Yet, a majority of our time is focused on worldly things that provide that temporary fix. It leaves us feeling in need of something more. Which is why people struggle with depression, anxiety, and hopelessness. Which is why the disciples were struggling with it on that Saturday. Who was their master on their, that Saturday? Was it God? Was it Jesus? No. Their master on that Saturday was their circumstances. They felt fear. Why were they feeling fear? Because they focused on the wrong thing. They had let their circumstances become their master, which made them worried about what was going to happen next. But if they only had remembered what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 22 through 23, he tells them the son of man is going to be handed over to men and they will kill him. There's the events of Friday. And he will be raised on the third day. Why in the world did his followers, his disciples, not remember what he said? Why are they behind closed doors afraid about what's going to happen? Why are they not at the tomb on the third day looking to see if Jesus had been resurrected? They either didn't believe him. Or they got so focused on their problems, on their circumstances, and let what they were facing in their life become their master, which caused them to be worried, which caused them to forget what their, their master, true master, had said. They didn't have a resurrection mindset because they were focused on the wrong master. And here's what the master taught in the next part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, For this reason I say to you, and, and this caught my attention this time versus other times I've read these verses. Jesus is connecting what we just read to this passage. Now I've taught this passage before about do not worry. You're about to hear it again. But he says we don't have to worry. 
because we have a master. If we focus on that master, if we keep our eye where it needs to be, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather crops into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And which of you by worrying can add a single day to his lifespan? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith, do not worry then saying, what are we to eat or what are we to drink or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your family, Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Basically, Jesus' point there is that if God provides for the animals, he's going to provide for you. Because you are made in the image of God. Birds are not made in the image of God. The flowers in the field are not made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. And if he takes care of the things out there, he's going to take care of you. So he continues. He says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Talk about God's kingdom, God's righteousness, right living. And all these things will be provided to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen there. He says, don't worry, but seek first his kingdom. What does he tell us? Keep your focus on following God. Keep your focus on his kingdom and his righteousness, on right living. And if you do that, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be concerned because you already know how the end of the game is written. It takes the experience out. It takes the the fear and the anxiety and the worry and the concern and the tension that we feel in life. It takes it out because we know how this story is going to end. So my last point, kind of, I have one more. But my last point is that when we focus on God, we discover we have no need to worry. Because you have a father that cares for you. You have a father that views you as his children, and he, I was going to talk about how he has boundless resources. He has endless resources. He has absolutely everything we need and will give it to us freely. So then why do we worry? And I'm preaching to myself this morning. Worry and anxiety is one of my biggest problems in life. And... This was convicting for me, because why do I worry? I have a father who's going to take care of me. I have a God that never sleeps. Maybe it's because my focus isn't always where it needs to be. Listen to this carefully. We talked about a little bit earlier how the things of this world cannot provide for you. God is the only master that we can serve that has already served us more than we could ever serve him. God is the only master that we can serve that has already served us more than we could ever serve him. Big tech has not done stuff for you. The things of this world, when we focus on them, they're going to leave you feeling empty. But God has already done more for you than anybody ever could. Today we celebrate that he died for us and that he was raised to life on the third day and because of that we can have new life in him. But you realize you wouldn't even have this life if he didn't create you in the first place. He knitted you in your mother's womb. He created you. He died for you. And now he gives us what we need. He is the only master that will outgive us 
that will outserve us. He already has, and he will continue to. So we need to focus on him. Even when times get dark, even when it seems like Jesus is dead, even when it seems like you're alone, even when it seems like the darkness around you is caving in, we have to have faith that God is still at work. No matter what happens to us, here's what Paul says. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. That's the resurrection mindset. That's the mindset that you have to have on Saturday. When it feels like Jesus is gone, when it feels like there's no hope, when it feels like your circumstances are closing in, Understand God can bring anything back to life. He can bring good out of any circumstance, out of any situation. So then the question is, why do we worry? Why do we get scared? Why do we get anxious? It doesn't make sense. Because no matter what happens to us, even if it results in death, we know how the ending of the game we call life ends. And that ending is good. To close today, I want to um, tell you the story of the Emmaus Road uh, encounter. Emmaus Road is, is um, told in the Bible in Luke chapter 24. And this was after they had done, went to the grave, some of the women went to the grave, and they had seen that Jesus was no longer in the grave. And some of his disciples are walking down this road to Emmaus, and we call it the Emmaus Road Experience. We're told that they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the one, only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? So there they are walking down the street, and he, here comes Jesus up beside them, the resurrected Jesus. This was not uh, Jesus in spirit form. This was the resurrected Jesus. This was Jesus as an actual person walking alongside of them. And they're talking about what's happened. And we're told that they were downcast. They were down. They were still depressed. They were still worried. Yet, they already knew that Jesus had been resurrected. Because here's what they tell Jesus. Um, They said, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. So here they are. They say, hey, he's not in the tomb. But they're not saying it with an excited voice. They're like, he's not there. They're still down and worried and downcast. And these are disciples of Jesus. These are followers of Jesus. People that probably heard Jesus teach that he was going to be resurrected on the third day. Yet they are still down. Is this not a picture of us today? We're walking through life down and depressed because of the circumstances that we have going on in life. And as followers of Jesus, we're told that Jesus is with us. That he is walking alongside of us in this road that we would call life. That he is there and we're telling him, hey God, do you not realize what I'm going through? Do you not realize the depression I'm feeling? Do you not realize the circumstances I'm facing? Do you not realize how hard life is? And Jesus is like, hey, I'm here. They were kept from recognizing him. And when we are still feeling worried and anxious and depressed, there's a sense that we're not recognizing him either. Eventually, he reveals himself to them. They find out his true identity, and then they say, uh, our heart was burning within us as we were walking alongside of him. How many of you have been through something in your life, and you look back, and you realize Jesus was with you through it all? You realize your heart was burning inside of you. 
you realize that he was there. You know, so often in our life, in the middle of the situation, we forget that Jesus is there. And the reason why is because we get so focused on everything else. Just as these disciples were, they were focused on everything else, but Jesus was there. They should have understood, and we should understand. And this is, this is if I had to define a resurre- resurrection mindset, here it is. We have to understand that anything bad, and I initially said can, be turned around for the good. And then I, I decided to change that because Scripture tells us it will be turned around for the good if you serve God as your master by focus on him. There's a key point in there. Paul tells us that God will turn all things around for the good, but it's for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. This is not one of those verses that applies to everyone in the entire world. This is a verse that specifically applies to God's people, to those who believe in the resurrection, to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's alive today, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the mindset that we as followers of Jesus can have, that anything bad will be turned around for the good if you continue to serve God by focusing on him as your master. Even death, that's the one thing that people thought was not able to be defeated. That's the one thing that they questioned. One thing that everyone thought, no one can beat death. That comes for everybody. And Jesus said, watch me. He beat death, and because he beat death, followers of him beat death. When you breathe your last breath, you'll be more alive than you've ever been before. So why do we worry about the small things in life? Why do we allow anxiety and depression and fear to cripple our life when we should have this resurrection mindset? The disciples should have been waiting in anticipation on Saturday to see what God was going to do. You know, they didn't know how the resurrection was going to take place. It could have been this big, grand thing where the whole world knew that Jesus was resurrected. He didn't choose to do it that way. But the disciples should have been on the edge of their seat waiting to see what was going to happen. Instead, they were on the edge of their seat waiting to see if they were going to get arrested. They were on the edge of their seat waiting to see if the score was going to catch up. When Jesus is like, I've already won. It's the same truth in your life. He's already won. You've already won because you're a believer in him. So we're going to sing. Um, Obviously, this is Easter Resurrection Sunday, and uh, we couldn't get out of here without singing Sunday's Coming. Because that kind of is the resurrection mindset. Friday was good because Sunday's coming. Because there was going to be life after death. No matter how bad your life gets, there's life after death. And so if you will, worship team, you can come on up. And uh, I want everybody to stand to their feet. I want heads bowed and eyes closed. I said something key that I want to make sure that you heard. This truth is for people who follow Jesus. Today is the day. For you to commit your life to him. If you're not a follower of Jesus. Commit your life to him today. Follow him so that this truth can apply to your life. Scripture tells us that to be a follower of him. We have to repent of our sins. Which means that we turn away from them. And that we come to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God that he died on the cross and that he was resurrected on the third day, that he is no longer in that grave. And when we do that, we're told that Jesus wipes away our sins as if we never sinned in the first place. And we are made right before God 
and that we are called to follow him for the rest of our life. When we follow him, we can rest in this truth that God works all things around for the good of those who love him. And that includes even in death. And so if you need to make that commitment today, or maybe you need to rededicate your life today, let's make Easter Sunday 2024 that day. The day in which you said, hey, I'm committing my life to you. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to live in a way that glorifies him. So that's you today. I want you to slip up your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Anybody? See that hand. See that hand. See that hand. See that hand. Anybody else? Lord, as we come to you in prayer this morning, 